Wonderful. Well, welcome everyone to today's webinar, Equity, Engagement, and Civic Leadership. How does your community rate? My name is Duncan Field, and I'm a community animator with the Tamarack Institute, and it's my pleasure to introduce today's discussion. But be before we get started, I wanted to take a moment and just reflect on the land that we're meeting on. Uh, we begin this workshop by acknowledging that we're meeting on Indigenous lands. And as settlers, we're grateful for the opportunity to meet and we thank all the generations of indigenous peoples who have taken care of this land. As settlers, this recognition of the contributions and historic importance of indigenous peoples must be clearly and overtly connected to our collective commitment to make the promise and the challenge of truth and reconciliation real in our communities. Now I'm joining today's call from Mississauga, Ontario, the traditional lands of the Huron-Wendat, Haudenosaunee, and Mississaugas of the Credit. And I invite you to take a moment and reflect on the land you're calling in from. And if you know, feel free to share it in the chat. We'd really, really appreciate it. So now I'm gonna pass it off to my colleague, Liz Weaver. Thanks so much, Duncan. And uh, welcome everybody to today's call. Um, I'm really pleased to have you all join us. Um, the session for the webinar today is titled Equity, Engagement and Civic Leadership. How does your community rate? And I'm really pleased to be joined by David Chrislip and Patty Schmidt. And I'm going to take a few minutes at the top end to introduce you to them both. They both have pretty impressive resumes. And then we're going to get into the conversation. And it's, uh, it's such a such a great um uh, a great day to kind of engage with them. So for more than four decades, David Chrislip has been working to build civic capacity through civic leadership development and collaboration. His career has taken him from the National Outdoor Leadership School and Outward Bound to the American Leadership Forum, the National Civic League and the Kansas Leadership Center. He is the principal of Skillful Means and senior fellow at the Kansas Leadership Center. He's the co-author with Ed O'Malley of a book called For the Common Good, Redefining Civic Leadership, which was published in 2013. He's the co-author with Carl Larson of Collaborative Leadership, How Citizens and Civic Leaders Can Make a Difference, which was published in 1994. And he's the author of one of my favorite books of all time, The Collaborative Leadership Field Book, which was published in 2002. It's kind of on my bookshelf, but a go-to book that I go back to all the time. Um, I'm now going to introduce you to Patty Schmidt. So Patty is the Community Development Director for the Office of Engagement and Extension at Colorado State University. In this role, she works closely with Colorado communities to address complex social, health, economic, and safety challenges. Additionally, she is the director of a unique leadership program called the Family Leadership Training Institute, FLTI, of Colorado at CSU Extension. FLTI is a community-based leadership program that utilizes an evidence-based curriculum to build, um, to build community member capacity to leaders in addressing local challenges in collaboration with content experts and decision makers across Colorado. The mission of FLTI is um, Oh, I'm kind of lost my space here. The mission of FLTI, of the FLTI Collaborative, is to bridge the gap between decision makers and community members so that communities can better learn, plan, and act together and targets community members who are often left out of community decision-making processes. And so, you know, the work of both David and Patty intersects quite nicely with the work that we do at Tamarack. And so we're really happy to have both of you join us today. So welcome, David and Patty. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm going to begin, uh, I think I'll start with you, David, and then we'll go to Patty next. But can you just give us, I, I've kind of given a bit of your bio, but you have like um, this real passion for civic engagement and leadership. So can you just uh, tell us a little bit more about that? And then we'll, we'll move over to you, Patty. Sure. And, and I want to start with a couple of things. First of all, just to, to thank you, Liz, and others at Tamarack for inviting us this is this we 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 think of tamarack and we think of the best organizations and civic engagement that we know about and so we're really happy to be here i also want to 
acknowledge all, all the people that are here too and and the to acknowledge your interest in these topics and your commitment to these topics because this is for me anyway it's the necessary work of our time and the last piece before I'll get to your question, Liz, is, is just to acknowledge that Patty and I have a third partner, partner in this work, a man named David McPhee. David is the, uh, right now is the interim director of the School of Social Work at the Colorado School of Public Health in, in, at Colorado State University in Fort Collins. And uh, David is a superb social scientist. And so he's, he's behind a lot of the stuff, if it has to do with data, da David is the data nut. And without, the th he's, he's a key part of this. And uh, so I just, I want you to know how much, uh, his, how important his role and what we're up to. So just a little bit more about myself and my interest in this. Um, I came into this, perhaps a bit of an odd angle. Um, I was working in wilderness-based experiential education and I was a course director and instructor for the National Outdoor Leadership School and the Outward Bound School. Um, these are powerful experiential education programs that use the physical part of the outdoors. They're transforming experiences. People that go to them come out differently than they when they went in, usually come out better more capable, and so on. Um, and back in about my direction with civic engagement and leadership really got started in 1983, I believe it was, a man named Joe Jaworski, who was the founder of the American Leadership Forum, brought, he called up and he said, I'm bringing a group of people from Houston, Texas. They're from the public sector, they're private sector, they're nonprofit, they're multiracial. And he said, I believe if we put them through an outward bound program, it's gonna change the way they work together, change their level of trust, build their level of collaboration. And that's really sort of changed the direction of, of, of my life from leadership development in a broader sense to a focus on civic leadership development. And after that, that took me, it took, it took me to the National Civic League. It took me to the Kansas Leadership Center. And it took me now with David and Patty at Colorado State University. And, you know, I just want to, you know, there's a, there's an element of great good fortune in this for me that I've had the opportunity to work with some really remarkable people and organizations. So Patty. Yeah, thank you, David. And I, you know, I echo David as well and his sentiments about just the gratitude to be here and with you, Liz and Duncan, and the folks who have joined us today to explore a topic that, you know, is really a, a piece of what I hold on to in thinking about some of the challenges we're facing now and have in the last year. And gratitude to David, you know, Chris Lip, but also our colleague David McPhee, who really is one of the reasons why I'm here today. And, you know, you, you did such a nice job of sharing our backgrounds. And, I, you know, in my work as community development director, I have the opportunity to interact with both rural and urban communities in the state of Colorado and get a sense and this really this nice gift to work with people thinking about these challenges, whether it's affordable housing or substance abuse and how can we work together to collaborate to address those issues in a way that really helps us to see some progress being made. And, you know, doing that over the years, I would say one of the key things that brought me to that work and that idea of collaborative leadership was by experiencing the program that you mentioned at the beginning, the Family Leadership Training Institute of Colorado. And, you know, that program came to the state of Colorado through our partners at the National Parent Leadership Institute with the idea that there was a need for this opportunity to make leadership capacity building more accessible. And, you know, now in my role as Director of Community Development, I'm able to think about and innovate with so many community leaders about how we more effectively bring the people power 
to the table. And, you know, that is something that is really key in order to make lasting change in the systems we live, work, and play in. But, you know, I wanted to, you know, I appreciate so many people in, that have inspired me over the years and the graduates of our Family Leadership Training Institute the, who've done such incredible work. But, you know, today in this moment, one of the reasons why, if I'm being honest, I'm here is an experience that I had over six years ago when I was, I received a call in the morning. And this call really changed my life in that it was a call from a mother who was calling me to let me know that a ch her child, who I was involved with programming with and who was mentoring, she had passed away over the night. And um, when I learned that, it really, I found it really devastating and the, the incredible loss for this 13 year old child to die. And, um, it was a week before her birthday, but what I realized or what I soon learned was that she passed away after experimenting with heroin. And in my mind, I couldn't understand how a 13-year-old child would have access to heroin. And I kept asking that question over and over in my mind. And what I realized was there wasn't just one answer to that question that there was many answers and there were many reasons why that existed. And so to your question about what's my interest in civic engagement, you know, I've been working in the nonprofit sector for over 20 years. And when I started that profession, I was really focused on how we work for community. And what that experience in the Family Leadership Training Institute and working for Colorado State University has really taught me is that we can't work for community. We have to work with community. And we have to figure out how to create more inclusive civic systems that allow all of us to explore topics like systemic racism, like affordable housing, like the opioid epidemic that we have going on in Colorado. And, and only when we can do that will we be able to make some discernible change? So interesting, um, both of your stories, because in many ways there are transformative experiences that we have, right? That really call us to this, this work with community. I appreciate that, Patty. And, and I think it, it is uh, really thinking about that and how do we create, how do we um, create those opportunities for others. I'm going to move us to the, the next question that we have, which is really to um, allow folks to kind of get a sense, David, of the Civic Capacity Index, which, you know, we, we started calling this webinar um, Equity, Engagement, and Civic Leadership. And so in some ways, uh, tell us about this Civic Capacity Index and how does it um, touch on some of these topics? Okay, I'm going to go back a few years and I'm going to do it in a sh short and to the point way. And Liz, if I don't do it in a short and to the point way, you, you uh, sort of corral me and bring me back. So uh, back in the 1980s, I was working with the National Civic League and a man named John Gardner, one of America's great public philosophers, was the chairman of the board of the National Civic League at the time. And several of us, John Parr, John Gardner, and some others at National Civic League, um, it, it was pretty clear to us. We could see that some communities responded better to challenges and disruptions than others. And it raised, it, it raised some questions for us. You know, I mean, the central question was why? Why are some communities able to do better in the face of these challenges than others? One of the things that popped, you know, you know, was common to our observations of these communities when we dug into it was that, that they were characterized by collaborative approaches to dealing with these challenges. They were working together, they were working across sectors, they were working across fashions, factions, it was inclusive, there was a constructive processes, they took the time to learn what was going on, well-informed, and so on. So, so um, one piece of it was just recognizing that this idea of collaboration was one of the answers to this question, why do some communities respond better than others? We could put it in another way as your, as your uh, webinar last week with David Matthews and John McKnight, you know, the doing with rather than doing for. 
that the way these communities approach change was rather than a small group of people deciding what the community needed and then trying to, to push that onto the community, that these were engaging people across the community to decide what needed to be done. And that work led to um, that book that you mentioned earlier, um, Liz, Collaborative Leadership, How Citizens Cit and Civic Leaders made, made it, make, Can Make a Difference. Uh, Carl Larson and I, Carl was a professor at, he is a professor emeritus at Denver University of Communications. And he's also, I don't have a PhD, but I often say I got my PhD from Carl Larson University. So anyway, we, uh, we did this research to see if we could learn about what makes collaboration work and came out with this book. Um, you know, that, that book has been picked up by a number of people, but one of the things that we can see that's come out in the last 20 years or so is we see in the rhetoric and the aspirations of public agencies, foundations, other civic actors, and so on, this aspiration to for community-driven change, to for collaborative community-driven change. Um, and I think there are three premises behind this, this aspiration. One of it is that, that from what we know from research that community driven change leads to more lasting progress. The outcomes have more le legitimacy and they're more equitable because they were, more, they were developed in a more inclusive way. They are, uh, it's more democratic because, they're, because it's more inclusive and egalitarian. And we also can see too, um, communities with capa the capacity for community driven chains are observably more resilient and responsive to disruptions and, and challenges. And we can see that clearly. And we'll talk about that later in this session um, with the civic capacity index. So what, I, what I'd like to do is just take a moment um, to engage you. Uh, the, this slide that Duncan has up there now, just take a look at this slide and you can see a spectrum here. On the left-hand side, we can see top-down top down or expert-driven change where usual voices, small coalitions, public agencies, local governments, foundations, and so on, from their own, from a more, um, um, a narrower perspective, deciding what needs to be done in a community and attempting to do it, to implement it. And over on the right-hand side, a more community-driven approach, usual and unusual voices working across factions, collaborative, inclusive, and so on. And what I'd like you to do, and if you put a, put a quick note in the chat, that would be great, is place your community or your region along this spectrum. First question is, you know, where, where, where do you think you are? Are you more towards the left, somewhere in the middle, perhaps towards the right? And once you said, this is where we are now, you might also make a note or put a star or put, uh, where would you like to be along this spectrum of civic engagement? And uh, we'll just take a look here in just a moment. So if you'd start posting some of those to the chat, let me know, are you over on the left end of this? Are you towards the right end? Um, where would you like to be on this spectrum? We've got some people already posting. Yep. Uh, so some of them are saying too top down, more community engagement needed. Mm -hmm. Others are in the middle. Another person posted moving towards the right from the middle, want to be 90% community uh, driven. Good. So yeah. So, you know, one of the things we can pick up quickly with this is that, that there's a gap between our aspirations to do this work and our rhetoric around this work and our ability to do it. And so one of the reasons we wanted to develop the Civic Capacity Index, it's a, it's a measure of this gap. And by using it as a measure of this gap, it can tell us what we might do to close the gap. Um, I'm, gonna, um, I'm gonna stop with that right now, Liz, just to, again, in the interest um, of time here. But, Great, and you know, we've got, um, David, we've got some more folks posting, so you can take a quick little check in the 
chat box, but that, that, that's, uh, I think it is, it, it's interesting, right? Where we think we are and our aspiration um, towards something different is a really interesting um, point that you've raised. I know that uh, when you and um, uh, David McPhee and uh, Patty were developing the Civic Capacity Index, you brought a group of folks together. Maybe, um, Patty, you can tell us a little bit about um, that process, but also some of the key design features that you built into the process. Sure, thank you, Liz, for that question. And I apologize if you're hearing some external noise. Um, you know, when we, when we were looking at developing an index, we were really looking at trying to develop a diagnostic tool to give communities a snapshot picture to begin identifying some areas or some gaps and how they work together. And so what we sat down, David and David and I sat down and did was start thinking about who could we invite to be a part of part of identifying what does community-driven change look like? And so that was a key question that informed our process. And it was really important to us to not only involve people who are researching this, you know, this topic area related to civic engagement and leadership development, but we were also really interested in making sure that we had various perspective and experience involved in that process. And so we were able to recruit 34 individuals ranging from faculty at universities to people who work for nonprofit agencies at the grassroots level to help us begin to get a clearer picture of what that, you know, what was, what community driven change really looked like. And um, we, we, at the leadership with David McPhee, were able to re recruit these individuals to go through a pretty in-depth process related to concept mapping so that we could, from the process, begin to whittle down a tool that would help us to evaluate that for various size communities and groups. David, would you add any more to that? Well, um, I think that's a good summary of what we did. I, just a, a little, uh, so you have a, no, a little idea of, of, of the uh, scale of this. So our question to these 34 panelists was, what would you see if community-driven change was occurring? And we really wanted to create, uh, we wanted to create a broader understanding of what community-driven change meant and we wanted to know what it looked like in practice and out of that we thought we could develop a civic capacity index. So when we asked this question we got somewhere in, Patty, I think this is right, somewhere in the neighborhood of say 700 or so responses, 700 from these 34 people. This is what community-driven change looks like. Now so our task was to figure out how, how do you how do you get, how do you digest what's, what's in this, these 700 characteristics? So this process that David helped, David McPhee helped us develop concept mapping process. First of all, we, you know, we, we, we took those 700, many of those overlap from those 34 people. So we took out, we combined the duplicates, combined like ideas with like ideas. And we ended up with something like two or 300 statements about a particular characteristic of community-driven change, we turned it back to our panelists and asked them to group these, just put them in affinity groups, like ideas with like ideas. And then David, with his statistical magic and this concept mapping process, was able to take the groupings from each of the 34 panelists, put them together into a, a statistical program that creates a composite group or of these, of these um, ideas that came out of it. What we ended up with, we ended up with 52 items in the, in the, civic, in the scale, Civic Capacity Index scale, 52 characteristics. And we, we um, and they seem to fall into seven different domains. And I just wanna summarize those here for a moment. That's what's on the slide in front of you now. So this is what came out of it. The characteristics of community-driven change, you know, and they fell in these, 
uh, seven domains. I've sort of summarized them into these four, four points here. But one of them was this uh, collective and pervasive capacity to exercise leadership from any part of the community or region, not just from those with authority or positions of influence and so on. Collective and pervasive cap capacity to exercise leadership from anywhere in the community. Um, that was that that was a um, so two of these that were really um, uh, somewhat surprising to us, I guess. This was one of them, how pervasive leadership is in these communities who can produce community-driven change. And the second one here, this a willingness to confront systemic injustice. And so and I say a willingness, a conscious, intentional uh, approach to confronting systemic injustice. It wasn't just an aside. There's an implication in this that, that was surprising to us. Uh, um, was, and there's the implication in this is this, look, if we can't deal with these issues of systemic injustice, if we can't deal with them, we're not going to be able to deal with all the other content issues that we care about. We can't deal with housing, education, health, environment, if we don't deal with systemic injustice. And so it, 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 the prominence of this was to see it so prominently displayed in the responses to this question. What do you see when community-driven change is occurring was surprising to us. Mm -hmm. The others, we could, we had, we've had some insight into that before. You know, the more commitment support of authority figures and institutions we have, the better things go. And the last part of it, if we have a collaborative civic culture, a sense of collective agency and a willingness to, and a culture of engagement, we're going to be better. We're going to make more progress on these kinds of issues. So in some ways, you know, this research, so it corroborated these last two points, corroborates, corroborates some things that we've known for some time. But the first two points really emphasizes some new dimensions of what, what, community-driven change and civic capacity means. Um, anyway, so the, the, the sum of this is that we created an instrument of fit that, that identifies 52 characteristics in seven domains, um, and that became what we call the Civic Capacity Index. Mm -hmm. And I would note to Liz that, you know, when, when we finalize the current draft that we're using right now, and we continue to update the index, but something that really is important to know for folks is that we did not identify that willingness to confront systemic injustice after really we saw the social injustice come to a forefront in the United States in May of last year. This was way before, you know, we knew that those problems existed, but this was before that happened. And so it's been interesting to me to, as people talk about various issues that their community is facing related to the pandemic or to complex adaptive challenges that they're facing, how many people at the table are saying, but how can we do anything about that until we do deal with the systemic injustice? And it was, um, really important to, to see that, that that sentiment that has existed for a long time, um, our, this tool really brought that to the forefront as well. Yeah, thanks for that. I can, uh, I can see that folks are uh, both posting in the chat box, but also putting questions into the Q&A and, and we're, we'll keep some time at the end. Uh, for the Q&A, but we've got a couple more questions um, that I want to chat with you about. So the next one is is for you, Patty, um, which is really, how do you think that the Civic Capacity Index helps the community understand its strengths and challenges in these three areas, these areas of engagement? And you've already spoken a bit about equity, but also around leadership. So how does, how does the index, how could the index help uh, community kind of both understand its strengths, but also maybe some of the areas where there could be, you know, some focused attention to work towards uh, improvement. Um, hold just a moment here. Liz or Duncan, could you put up the next slide? 
because I think this sets up Pat, Patty to, in some ways, to answer your questions there, if we have that for some reference. Perfect. Yeah. Great. Thanks, David. So, so the way the index, I think, really sets communities up. And to be honest with you, right now, we're really just experimenting with the tool and continuing to learn and adapt as we learn as it's being employed, you know, how we can utilize this tool. So one of the things we're hoping that this conversation can result in is more people utilizing this tool to assess their civic capacity in their, in their local communities. But one of the things we're really seeing this is as a low stake starting point to simply assess how are we working together? And, you know, where are some gaps in how we work together that we can start thinking about the processes we have in place so that we can make more progress. So a great example of this is the, you know, hundreds of conversations that communities across the world are talking about in regards to recovery from the pandemic. And a lot of people are talking about what they should do. So we should do this, we should do this. To, we should do that. And one of the things that I think, you know, we're experimenting and talking to folks with is not only do you need to be talking about what you should do, but you need to talk about how the process that you're going to work together on in identifying what you're going to do in your recovery planning process. So making sure that you know where your strengths are and then where your gaps are so that the strategies and solutions that you choose for recovery are as effective as possible. And a key component of that addresses the equity question as well. What voices are present in your current civic systems or the systems that you have set up to collaborate and engage with? And what voices are missing from that process? And what is it gonna take to create a process that makes people feel like they belong at the table, but not only do they belong, but there's places where they can really take leadership. And what, what we're seeing as people are using this tool is it's a really great anchor, a place to like start the conversation. So if you look on the left of the index, you'll see kind of this, what we've learned through utilizing the index is we are able to identify where communities' civic capacity may be suffering, where they may be struggling, where they're maintaining and where, where they're thriving. And so what we can then see is identify different areas where we might be able, when we go in deep to the items that go under those dimensions that David talked about a little bit earlier, is to identify some ways or some areas that people might be able to think about the process that sets, that's set in place around those dimensions and where they might strengthen that approach. Yeah, yeah. thanks for that, uh, Patty. And, and David, I know that um, there have been communities already that have utilized this index and you've, you've got Colorado here as, uh, as a bit of an example, but can you maybe tell us a little bit about what you're learning as communities um, experience this and, and engage with it and um, what your team is kind of thinking about from there? Okay. Well, this, this chart's a good place to start for that. So this is a summary of, of about 500 responses to, to individuals in Colorado counties. And it's, this is an aggregate chart of those 500, kind of a cross section of Colorado. Now you can see, you take a look at this scale here too. You can see that, that on the average, this runs at about 60% or so, or 60 out of 100 on, on the scale that the Civic Capacity Index uses. Most of these communities, we have a, most of these communities characterize themselves at this level as either struggling or maintaining, in, for example, in response to the pandemic. We're either having a hard time or we're just keeping our head above water. We don't, you know, nobody's up in the thriving category on this. Now, if we broke this down a little further, and this is one of the ways we're using it, Liz, is we asked, uh, David McPhee asked the uh, Colorado Department of, of, of um, Health and Environment to, to 
to give us a, a sampling of Colorado communities, um, Colorado communities that had responded well to the pandemic and those that had responded not so well. So part of this study that we're up to right now is to take those, I think, eight or 10 counties, something like that across Colorado, some of which responded well, some of not so well. If we were to disaggregate this, what we, we would see some different results show up here. There is about a 20 point difference between those that respond well, according to the Colorado Department of Health and Environment and those that responded poorly to it. So we know that this measure is, is discerning enough to tell us how much civic capacity, how much difference civic capacity makes in terms of our response to challenges like the pandemic here. Uh, one of the things we'll do with these is we'll take that data and we'll use it as Patty described earlier, we'll use that as an entry to a conversation with them about here's what the data shows and, and we'll take that and use that to how do we, how, how can we develop ways, strategies, approaches, and so on for us to, to enhance our civic capacity, to build our resilience, to be able to handle uh, future challenges and, disruption, and disruptions, which we know are already on their way too. Um, you're, I've done a little work with you, Liz, in the Danville region. You know, the Danville region picked up on this with a similar data chart. You, you also, one thing you can notice very quickly here, how much the justice domain here stands out. In, in all the data we've gotten, it's, it's lower, significantly lower than the other domains. Communities don't generally do well with confronting systemic injustice that we were talking about earlier. And it shows up here in the Civic Capacity Index. Now the, the Danville region, that, that uh, group, took a, a, a small sample of uh, the group that you're working with, took the, develop, took the Civic Capacity Index, developed the scale and says, look, we need to do this across the region. We really need to do it. We really need to be sure that we have a sample that reflects our community. And the thing that we want to use it for is to start some conversation around systemic injustice. So that's one of the, another case of using this. And I think Patty's got one uh, a case or so if we could squeeze that in and, and still give us in the next three to five minutes or so and give us a few minutes for some questions. Sure, yeah, I like it. why don't you uh, let us <laughs> jump in here and share? Because I think it is really interesting. So you developed the uh, capacity, civic capacity index with a lot of partners and now you're in the kind of testing out the index and then learning how groups are responding or counties are responding or regions are responding. So it is like, it's very much your uh, formative, but now kind of moving into the next phase. So Patty, another story would be great. <laughs> yeah, so, so our interest is really seeing with different audiences and community groups, like how, a, how can this help make progress on building civic capacity? So we're working with, for example, a government, a county run effort to utilize this tool in the recovery planning. And so that's one of the ways that we're working to implement the Civic Capacity Index to inform how that county is really looking at um, planning for the recovery and how they're gonna utilize and spend the dollars, millions of dollars that they're going to spend on their recovery. Another great example, so that's a really government-led effort. And then, you know, in the Denver area, we'll, we'll be utilizing this tool with a grassroots neighborhood-led area who's interested in understanding better how their civic capacity is really laying out. And they don't, they don't call it civic capacity. <laughs> you know, they, they're, they're really trying to create this sense of community and a better community connectedness. And so they really felt like it was key to understand what's happening and what 
you know, how is everybody who's working, working together or not working together? And so that's another great example how we're looking forward to utilizing this tool and working with folks at the grassroots level to say, how can you utilize this tool to dig deeper into what's going on in your community and think about, you know, understanding your processes in order to, for future planning, you can strengthen how effective you are to work together. It would be interesting to me to think about, you know, over time, right? Mm -hmm. Does, if you use this almost as a, as they are in Danville River region, where they had a small group of collaborative leaders kind of come up with, you know, their index results, and then they're going into a broader kind of community conversation around this. And then a year mm -hmm. later has, has the interventions that have happened or the work that has happened in between, has that increased civic capacity mm -hmm. or has it created more questions around civic capacity? So it would be kind of interesting to be able to ta uh, track this over time as well. I know it's early days, but it would yeah. be interesting to do that as well. Well, it's interesting you should mention that, Liz, Liz because one of, one of the groups that we're partnering with has been involved in a affordable housing and health equity engagement effort that's run by the city. And we're utilizing the tool at the end of their two years to assess how civically engage the folks, any of the participants in the multiple things that they did and the multiple policies that they created, how civically engaged they feel now that they were involved in some capacity during that two year process. So ideally we would have done that two years ago when they started it and then two years later, but we are able to do some assessments about the impacts of their efforts and make some recommendations on future engagement efforts that the city will lead. Yeah. So we're excited to experiment with that as well. So I, I can see that there are a number of questions that are popping up in the question and answer um, area. And so maybe what we're gonna do is, is stop my questions and actually uh, turn over to that. So Duncan, I'm gonna bring you back on board and uh, see if you can bring forward some of those questions for us. Sure, thanks Liz. Uh, the first question uh, comes from, oh, it's an anonymous attendee. Just asking for a concise definition of civic capacity, if you could offer one. Okay. So, um, you know, that's a hard question to give a concise definition. You know, we, it's easy to say what civic capacity, civic capacity is the capacity of, a, in our, one of our definitions, is the capacity of a community or a region to respond to challenges and, and disruptions. That's, that's probably the most concise way. Now, what the Civic Capacity Index does, it breaks that down and says, well, well so Civic Capacity, that's a pr pretty general statement. Again, it breaks this down into 52 characteristics that fall on these seven domains of leadership, justice, institutions, civic culture and so on. So it's, it's, it's related to, we could define civic capacity, for example, as that chart that we had up here earlier that talked about the pervasiveness of leadership, the willingness to conf confront systemic injustice, the capacity of institutions and uh, uh, authority figures to engage and support civic engagement, and then the ability of communities, the civic culture of communities, their ability to come together collaborate, build coalitions, learn together, and so on. And I would just add to that, you know, when I describe, because I get called on this by my friends all the time when I talk about civic capacity, they're like, what do you mean, Patty? And what I think that really has stood out for me over time, and I've talked with many of my colleagues about is civic capacity is a community's ability to learn, plan, and act together. That's good. Yep. Yeah, that's very concise. Duncan? Yeah, thank you for that. Uh, a question we've had from a few folks. Is the index available for other communities to use? Patty, you want to pick up on that one? 
Yeah, absolutely. Yes, we are very um, interested in seeing how many communities we can get who might utilize that tool. And what I would say is after this webinar, David will, with Liz's help, provide a, a little brief for you to take a look at, and it'll give you some information about how you can work with us to utilize that tool in your local community. And then um, just, just to mention too, our longer term goal is really to build out not only the index and continue to fine tune that index, but also to build out the resources with partners like Liz and the Tamarack Institute to make sure that we're not just assessing where people are at, but really providing resources and tools with partners to help communities explore how they can strengthen the different areas and how they learn, plan, and act together. So our goal in the future is to really house this index online so that any community across the world could utilize this tool and, um, and have access to partners like the Tamarack Institute to build their civic capacity. Thanks, Patty. Duncan? Yeah, thank you. Our next question comes from Abdullah, who's actually joining our call from Senegal. And they asked, uh, what do you think about civic engagement and leadership in Africa? And I would also add just in, in terms of how place-based this approach is. Well, that's, you know, that this is a really a, um, a hard question. One, we think that these ideas have some applicability in other places, you know. But we're not far enough along to have tested that or done much experimenting with it. So I, and to directly answer your question about what do you think about, I don't know that much about civic engagement and leadership in, in Africa. Mm -hmm. uh, I believe that this tool could be modified for it. We have one example here, we have translated it into Spanish. So it's available in Spanish for, for our use. We've also have a, have a, um, a man at uh, Kansas State University, a Hungarian man, who's translated into Hungarian. Now here you can see some of the challenges that we have um, because some of these ideas of, about civic engagement and civic leadership are, to say the least, not prominent in Hungary at this moment. Um, and, and so the, the to, to use this in another place, we would have to go into a, we, we think the concepts at a, at, a, at a sort of meta concepts of these ideas are applicable in other places, but how to make those things culturally understandable, culturally appropriate, we're not there yet. We can make some headway on, with, with, with Spanish speaking people here in the US We've got an experiment going with the Hungarian piece, but we just don't know enough yet. And we're definitely open to partners to look at that. And I know there's some, there's some really fantastic work happening from people like the Community Initiatives Group, um, as well as the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation related to civic wellness and, you know, combining not just looking at any economic indicators to determine whether or not a community is thriving, but really combining community development and civic wellness into that mix so that we can have a better understanding of how to support and build the capacity within communities for communities to thrive and to see more equity or equitable outcomes for communities regarding uh, how, how we define what wellness looks like. Yeah, thank you both, that, that's very helpful. Our next question comes from Tim and Chris uh, and a few other folks combined. I'll, I'll read Chris's version of the question here. Uh, they ask, most of where I live and work is made up of rural, widely distributed, smaller communities, less than a thousand people. Have you seen significant differences in strengths and challenges with regards to assessing, understanding, and building civic capacity in smaller communities? Well, you know, I can, I can offer a couple of observations on this. Um, 
One, you know, we have, I mentioned earlier that we have something like 500 responses and they're pretty much across the spectrum here in Colorado from rural and urban. And we haven't really had it that much of a chance to dive into that and see what the distinctions are. But a couple of them that, 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 se that seem to, that, 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 that seem to be uh, coming out of that. In some smaller communities, there is, we often have, we, we've called it in Kansas and Colorado and some, you know, there is a, the, the sort of city fathers approach to, to, to civic leadership. You know, there, is a, there are a group of people who have been in influential positions for some years. And it seems in smaller communities that may be, may be more prominent than it is in larger communities because larger communities are so diverse and the populations are so large. So that's one distinction that may be coming up. And again, we haven't dug into this enough to know. Um, so uh, Patty, you may have an observation you want to throw in there. You know, before you jump in, Patty, it, it just seems to me, and I think, you know, this is my experience uh, having been involved with the collaboration lab in the Danville River region, and, and they're kind of taking this on and applying it in their context is that it's also contextual, right? While you might see things that are relevant across communities, I think for me, what seemed to be most important for Danville River region was the reflection of what their collective intelligence was, and then the opportunity for that to seed some further conversations about how they might go deeper with it, right? So it, it, it's, it's a little bit of both, right? It's, it's not only thinking about, hey, would this work in my context? And what could I learn, you know, about the community that I'm living in and the civic capacity of my community? And then what's the trends overall? So it, it, that, that's what I like about the index is that it has it has that opportunity to have kind of both those perspectives. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's good. And when we get more of this data in, we're going to, and we break it down into, into say communities, neighborhoods, regions, and so on, look at it, those different levels, we're going to see different things come to the fore. Yeah. Different dimensions of this will, and uh, we're just not far enough along to say a whole lot about that at this point. Yeah, I I agree with I agree with both of you and Liz. I, you know that your example is a good, great example of the power of this tool. Is it's really the power is in the conversation. It's not in taking the survey. It's what happens afterwards for me. But I'm also partial to <laughs> community development and community conversations. But you know the the index is an opportunity to understand the stories of the people who live in your community, whether that's rural or that's urban. It's really designed to give you a chance to get to know the stories better and get to know the people around you better, so that you can figure out what works specifically for your local community, and. Um, in being community driven, we understand and we fully expect there's not one size fits all that, you know, this is something that needs to be adaptable for that very reason. Yeah, and I really like the fact that, you know, um, you're thinking about, okay, so if, for example, you know, in the area of uh, collaboration, we need to upskill our community, what are the tools and resources that are out there to help us do that, right? What's some of the kind of leading thinking in that area. So it's not only just the index, but it's also then providing the, the resources to help communities move forward in a, in a planful kind of way, right? The plan, do, act kind of way. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so good. Um, Duncan, do we have time for one more question or are we coming to the end of our time here? We might be able to sneak in one more. Okay. Um, a question from uh, Tim. Uh, sorry, uh, someone else just jumped to the top, but I'll, I'll read Tim's question here. How does this tool address the issues of gentrification? Do you have strategies to learn about how the changes and results over time are impacted by gentrification? Well, that's an interesting question and a, a couple of quick comments on that. One, um, 
I, I suppose it, it could be used to address a specific issue of gentrification if that's the if that was the presenting issue that you had in a community, it could be used as a diagnostic tool um, that would tell you how the community sees its processes for dealing with issues like gentrification. It wouldn't tell you much about gentrification itself, but it would tell you about how well the kinds of processes that you might use here. Something we might see over time though as if, if you were to use the civic capacity index in a particular area of a city, say, that you knew had been is, is gentrifying over a period of time, and you used it, say, a couple years apart over a period of 10 years, and you knew this, this area was gentrifying, I believe you would probably see some changes in civic capacity there. You know, I'm not quite sure what the direction of those changes would be, but I'm, I'm sure that gentrification does affect a particular neighborhood's civic capacity. You know, it, 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 gentrification implies some sort of homogenization, I guess, is my, that's happening there. And so you might see a decline actually in the civic capacity to deal with others that weren't part of that homogenized group. I also think it gives you a great, um, like with that example with gentrification, the civic capacity gives, potentially gives you an opportunity to look at one piece of civic capacity of what is our willingness to come to the table and learn from each other and not just show up thinking we know everything there is to need to know about gentrification. And that's such a key um, component to making lasting change and systemic change. And so if that, the index could potentially identify that as a gap in, where, in the processes that are existent in a local community. Yeah, I, you know, it's, uh, thank you for that. Cause I do think it is looking at the seven, um, the seven areas and then the elements under each of the seven areas. And I bet that everybody on the call either has linked already Duncan to the resource that you put in the chat box. If you haven't, you uh, will be sending you a link to that resource as well. Um, but on behalf of Tamarack, I really want to thank you, David and Patty for uh, joining us. I think this is going to be the first of uh, maybe a call that we'll do in a year from now just to see where we are in this process and okay. and uh, what you've been learning. And um, uh, yeah, so thank you so much for your time. I'm going to just throw it over to Duncan really quickly to wrap us up. Yeah, thanks, Liz. I just want to echo Liz's thoughts and say thank you for, for sharing your wisdom with us. And thank you to all of you for spending your time with us this afternoon or this morning or whatever time it is where you're calling from, you're gonna hear from us in the next day or two with a full recording of today's call, a link to the resource that was uh, shared in the chat here, as well as a number of other learning opportunities. Feel free to reach out if you have any questions and we encourage you to check out some of our other free community building webinars. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.